When Marion and I started Weissman Freddy Architecture, Landscape, and Urbanism, in that name was very much what we were interested in, which was to think very deeply about architecture and its relationship to a site. In much of our work, we're trying to create connections that never existed before, and that could be a community, that could be a landscape, or that could be a topography. to see both of you again. Uh, we already had a wonderful start in our introductory chat on Tuesday. Um, I, didn't, I wasn't quite expecting, but we covered a lot of interesting topics in that short time. So we can just expand on what we started off with. Uh, you know, for a long time, we wanted to get both of you to Dhaka at some point. Um, you know, for, for, for a longer duration or a public talk, but I think hopefully it will happen sometime soon. I just wanted to tell you there is a, uh, a big group of people who are really drawn to your work. And so it's very important that we uh, allow a, a better sort of, you know, understanding of what's going on, uh, what, uh, what they are drawn to. So that's my task, you know, to bring you, uh, unfold your projects a bit more. Uh, let me start out uh, by uh, reading a paragraph from your book, Public Natures. I was drawn to it. I've been like looking at it uh, for the last few days. It's right here. You can see that, that green book. <laughs> um, we saw the green book. Uh, that's right. <laughs> um, the, uh, the paragraph is, uh, you're saying, we are interested in a new model of practice that integrates all fields of design through yet to be codified protocols. A synthesis residing at the periphery of disciplinary definitions, but perhaps at the center of a wholly new form. I was drawn to it myself because then I think what we do at Bengal Institute, our the mission that we have set up is just this. We're gonna use this line and change our mission statement and that's it. But I think, you know, what I'm drawn to is, you know, why perhaps, can we start off with that? Why perhaps at the center of a whole new form? There's a kind of hesitation or skepticism about this, is there? Or is it still what you call an evolutionary topic? Um, Kazi, yeah. it's a wonderful question and thank you for pulling out that, that thread because in many ways, as we were working on the book Public Natures, we realized that the focus of our work has tended to reside outside of disciplinary boundaries. And arguably, disciplinary boundaries are very good for professional purposes. Um, and yet sometimes they start to put limits on a way of thinking and a way of uh, beginning uh, a form of thought on any given project. And so when we say perhaps, or perhaps in many ways is a quiet nudge at the kind of amplitude of of investment in disciplinary separations, um, and the perhaps suggesting that there could be something, um, in a sense, more profound if we think synthetically uh, and draw the threads or essences of what's at stake for each project, rather than, in a sense, recognizing that it needs to fall in chapters, uh, in separate chapters of ways of thinking about uh, both an approach and, and the importance of the values in any given question. Yeah, I would add, um, Ozzy, that we both started our practice um, when the world was immersed in, I think, the promise of globalization. Um, as a counter to that, it was also the realization that our environmental crises uh, were increasing at a more significant rate, um, and they were not uh, specific to any one region. They were global. So I think as we started our practice, these two, um, I think realizations um, caused us to kind of think about the role of architecture, 
the role of landscape, the role of environment, and the role of, of infrastructural design with the realization that uh, we could no longer focus on a very, very specific disciplinary um, product, um, nor could we focus specifically on an isolated site as if it didn't exist um, outside the boundaries of a much larger context. Right. Uh, you already mentioned the I word, uh, infrastructure, and uh, that's a huge uh, concept uh, in your work. And you laid out quite openly uh, right at the front of the book, you know, evolutionary infrastructures. And I, I think uh, while going through your work and the book itself, I have like finished uh, half a notebook, uh, just taking notes and my thoughts. And I want to think about it a bit more with you. Um, like what is infrastructure as far as architecture? design is concerned and I say this especially giving attention to aspiring architects like you know I don't think the school really takes on infrastructure in such a disciplined fashion as you would like or you in your practice are doing and I think many of you you yourself you know teaching studios you bring that uh, whole topic uh, but I don't think there is a sort of a, a theoretical historical understanding of infrastructure as far as architectural design is concerned uh, and so there are a lot of things that remains, uh, I would say, quite unclear to those architects or students. Is it a question of scale? Is it a question of scope? Is it a question of complexity? I think you had a, a wonderful roundtable discussion uh, and also a conversation with Kenneth Frampton regarding this. And, and the moment you bring infrastructure to architecture, you have a whole a lot of other topics that come up, mega form, mega structure. And there you have a whole history uh, in modern architecture and onwards regarding that. Uh, I, um, so I was wondering uh, here, um, well, you also claim that uh, with your projects, especially in Seattle, perhaps uh, you are, uh, you, you are uh, arriving at a new paradigms for infrastructure, you know, I think if I can recall that. I was thinking also with infrastructure that uh, infrastructure is what sort of construct cities, drive cities, manages cities, and, and therefore it's also primarily very technologically driven. But at the same time, we are, have to deal with the leftovers, if you like, or the interstitial spaces with each technological epochs. And, and Seattle is, if I am not uh, incorrect in saying that, is to deal with that sort of technological sort of leftovers, uh, or the leftover spaces out of technological epo epochal uh, changes. So, you know, I, I don't know how to stay. So uh, the intersection of infrastructures led by technological regimes, we are led to this, but can technology also help us in overcoming the isolations, the islands that technology has created? You know, that's just one thought. And I, I wonder if you want to respond to that because in your work, there's a lot of, again, technological aspect, you know, uh, beyond the architectural design, beyond the landscape design, and that may remain at the back that there is that. I wonder if you can start with that. Sure, I, I think um, we actually define infrastructure rather broadly. And I, I think, Kazi, we also want to uh, dispel the myth that infrastructure is purely about engineering, purely about technology. The infrastructure has an enormous impact on the social life of buildings, the social life of open spaces, the social life of cities. So I think we want to think of infrastructure in its broadest context. And the idea of infrastructure has a performative goal, which we think uh, architecture should have. Infrastructure has a much larger systemic agenda. And we think architecture should have a larger systemic agenda. And infrastructure, maybe accidentally, but very profoundly, has a social agenda, which we think architecture should also. You know, Kazi, you've touched on something very important, which is the technological, which, as Michael said, we think is part of the equation, but not all of the equation when we think about infrastructure. 
But you've also touched on what we call the leftover edges of things. And arguably, you could say many of the sites that are, quote, perfect have begun to disappear as cities grow. Um, <clears throat> and in many ways, they grow with an accommodation infrastructures of trade, infrastructures of highways, infrastructures of movement. Right, right. All those infrastructures have tended to slice and dice the perfect sites, particularly near waterfronts. So when we think about infrastructure, um, in many ways, we're often contending with infrastructures that are um, out of date or so imposed on a place that one needs to bring a new kind of infrastructure into the equation to um, accommodate things that may or may not be something that can be changed or moved. And hence in Seattle, it was about superimposing 200,000 cubic yards of earth to create a new infrastructure, which was a landform that could connect the city to the water's edge. So the thing that becomes important in our thinking about architecture is that architecture might be given a simple site and a simple program. And those boundaries are property boundaries that in a sense guide the owner in terms they can ask an architect to consider. And in our work, we're very preoccupied with thinking about those considerations that pass through and connect with that site and that endeavor. And whether it's water, whether it's electricity, whether it's sewage, whether it's trains and cars and boats and uh, all kinds of things that, in a sense, eviscerate the pureness of the site, those are the infrastructures that we feel we need to begin with in our thinking. Um, prior to superimposing a top-down architectural vision mm -hmm. and infra, literally the interior idea of things that are in motion um, and at stake uh, are both fighting um, and challenging for us. And, and we think of them as equal protagonists in the evolution of architecture. Um, I, I think I'm going to be picking up on that topic of the site uh, and then overcoming the site and engaging with flows as we have talked about in the last uh, discussion. But uh, I just want to uh, continue this for a little bit more uh, understanding infrastructure uh, in respect to in your discussions with others, you have brought up mega form, mega structure, land form, place form, you know, there's a whole cluster of notions that are circulating around infrastructure. Um, is infrastructure still a provisional uh, topic uh, that you want to kind of revise uh, in an evolution of topics, actually? Is it like still infrastructure or superstructure, or I might say even ultrastructure? Because, you know, you kind of make infrastructure a very, from a provisional thing, from an evolutionary thing, something definitive, a thing. <laughs> it, it's now a thing, actually. So um, I, I wonder about that. Uh, but just then in a kind of historical context, uh, this discussion between what is megaform, and you continue that discussion in your book quite a bit, versus versus what perhaps was not laid out too much was what I would call ecological matrix, which perhaps is landform or placeform. Uh, so within the, in the history of megaform, uh, ide ideology or ideas, you know, we have the Japanese metabolists, uh, you have even Yona Friedman, all the way to Paul Rudolph, um, Archie Graham, all those people, if I can uh, lay it out that way. And, uh, and on the other hand, ecological matrix, perhaps Olmsted. And I wonder, uh, I, I wonder uh, where your works uh, are kind of cited here, because if I am not wrong in saying in the mega form or, met, or the mega structural uh, group, I think topography is either marginalized or subsumed, it's there. While in the ecological matrix, it begins from topography and it explodes mm -hmm. and you know, kind of engages that, which I find in your work, I wonder. I think, um, actually, you're pointing out a, uh, <clears throat> I suppose, a, 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 a train of thought that in some ways I think was highlighted by, by Frampton's essay right. on, and um, uh, in our discussions with Professor Frampton, you know, I think he was very drawn to Seattle as a way of um, seeing what he imagined megaform to be. And I think it's very much consistent with our privileging the ecological agenda over the purely structural. I, I think the 
Japanese metabolists, even Yona Friedman, perhaps to a certain degree, were very much attracted to the sculptural and um, mm. qualities of the megaform, uh, particularly its size and its expressiveness, uh, the metabolism mm. in particular. Um, I think in our case, and maybe because of this particular agenda that we as, as a world are facing, I think we've tried to um, privilege the ecological agenda. So uh, Seattle, for example, um, has a kind of intense topography, but that intense topography is um, at the service of both collecting water, but also uh, collecting people and allowing people to inhabit. So there's a kind of uh, what we had talked about earlier, this sort of a social agenda to megaform, which I think um, we probably share with the metabolists, it's subtler. Uh, I want to elaborate a little bit on this question of um, the role of topography in the kind of megastructural idea of thinking and the kind of ecological. And I think, Kazi, you've touched on something interesting, which is that topography in many ways is absent in much of the work of the metabolists or the folks who've looked at megaform, megastructure. As Michael said, it's really about a structural manifesto that is broad in its territorial expanse, but not necessarily um, engaged with the territory that it's, it's expanding upon. Ecological thinking by its very nature has to think about the forces of the form itself and uh, the shape of water, the shape of movement, um, erosion, strength, identity, things that can grow, not grow. Um, and our own preoccupation with topography it began very early on in our project for Olympia Fields, which was recognizing that we had flooding at stake in the Midwest. And we had an opportunity through creating and inventing a new topography to recast the paradigm of water retention and detention from something that was simply structural to something that could in fact become a new part of the identity of its place. And in that regard, certainly the, uh, the thinking of Olmsted, who in a sense was uh, there at the invention, if you will, of landscape architecture as a field that sort of brought the thinking of agriculture and the kind of process of, you know, the picturesque and merged them into something that could actually start to form a discipline. That's a simplification there. Uh, it was that systemic idea of cultivation that I think is the root of what we find a place of entry to both, and that we literally are cultivating sites now for new kind of infrastructures, like a mental as well as an ecological position right. and tries to do less um, uh, rather than doing something that's superimposed over it. In our project uh, for Taekwondo Park in Korea, in South Korea, what was interesting there was that there was a hundred meter grade change. We had several buildings. Um, the intent of the original was to build in the valley and we said actually avoid the valley and traverse the valley through a series of bridges and only build within, embedded within the hillside to preserve the flow of water rather than to stop it. And that became the tree and premise of the scheme. We were fortunate to, um, fortunate to see that they have, as they've built it, have really amplified that narrative of water in the cultivation of what is there in place today. Yeah, I would, uh, I think, not to belabor this particular point, but I think, because uh, you, you are raising a very important topic it has to do with uh, topography. And I think for us, topography is also the section. I think in much of our work, we privilege the section because often it's the section, the plan uh, is um, first and foremost, a sort of abstract organization of form or territory. But the section uh, involves flows, involves flows of people, flows of water, flows of water, um, through a building or through a territory. So. The topographic um, um, impact for us, at least, um, is something that we need to reckon with um, as a discipline. And that topography, uh, whether it's entirely artificial and embedded inside the section of a building, has an impact on how people move, how air moves. If it is part of a larger territory, it has a, obviously a, a very strong ecological and social agenda. So we do, I think, um, as you mentioned, uh, correctly so, uh, are very intrigued 
with uh, the idea of topography as a generator. Right. Uh, well, the, the, you know, I think you, you, you already mentioned this wonderfully, cultivating sites. You know, with topography, you then uh, arrive at a number of uh, very important uh, challenges and realizations and uh, architectural motivations, if you like. You know, cultivating sites is one. With topography, you one now have to deal with ground, the grounding which uh, in many of these urban projects is also about uh, the violence that have happened on that side prior, before your arrival. And now uh, the projects become either remedial or redemptive in, in my sense. Mm -hmm. uh, re mm -hmm. Redemptive in terms of restoring bruised ecologies. In Seattle especially, I see that, obviously, everyone sees that, and that's why it's wonderful. Uh, beyond the kind of the beautiful sort of landscape uh, organization, you know, the public realm, you know, I, I'm going to be talking about that also, the, the, the flow of the architectural promenade, if you like. But I think the mm -hmm. first of all, the whole issue of restoring bruised ecologies, you know, and that's very important for me. Uh, but that then leads up to, uh, two uh, different conversations and I don't know which one to begin with first. One is, uh, therefore, is it then mega form? You know, you're not using mega form, you're using say infrastructure, but I mean, uh, may I suggest a meso form or meso form, meso form, mm -hmm. which is a, a mediation between the infinite, infinitude of the world, which is what it is, the world is infinite, it doesn't have boundaries, you know, and, and the more sort of uh, comprehensible, spatial sort of constraints, which are say architectural boxes and what have you. So is it more mesoform rather than megaform? You know, but with, with megaform, you're already in a other sort of, you know, very complicated and complex and problematic mm -hmm. notions. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not posing this as a, as, as a thought actually, not a question. So that's uh, number one. But I think with that, perhaps you can say something about it. But with topography and this whole business of cultivating sites, we are led to what Marian said the other day beautifully. Uh, your, uh, your, your work is to delay architecture as much as possible. And I said, that's such a wonderful idea, a wonderful thought. But really, what does that mean? Um, what does that mean? Can we talk about that, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. So from cultivating sites, constructing sites, to delaying architecture. Here's something that as we were uh, listening to your dialogue with uh, and you is that there were some really, I think, beautiful observations that the two of you were making about literally constructing sites. I mean, basically, as he was saying, you know, cities that, you know, cities in Bangladesh, if you were thinking about the kind of growth potential if cities are growing exponentially as they have in China, the invention of where a site needs to be needs to be conceived in rigorous terms right. because we can do it right or we can sort of miss the target by choosing the wrong location to uh, have growth. You know, choosing Venice as a site today would be an unwise decision. That's right. And, you know, I think that question of what site is versus given versus made, I mean, David Leather has been very influential for sure. And I, from the outset of our practice, actually, in terms of our own thinking, which is constructing a site first and delaying architecture as long as possible, just as mm -hmm. a, and so that we're, we're really interrogating that notion of site in every project. Mm -hmm. And sometimes actually borrowing systems that belong to adjacent sites, as we did in Seattle, you know, the adjacent Fertile Edwards Park, the adjacent shoreline, as things to leverage as ingredients or content in our site, even if they're outside of our property lines. And, you know, so this question of what, what it means to be outside the property lines mm. of, That's uh, right. has been typical to architecture is the very thing that we are, I think, super excited about. Because, you know, I think that delaying architecture for us really is expanding the bandwidth of our, of our research and our to understand that which is at stake and that which is in place and that which has been superimposed over and in a sense erased. So the latency of site is something we wouldn't understand if we didn't delay our action uh, and our desire to sort of create form. And certainly we are as invested in that as anybody else. But by delaying architecture, often what we find is that the net result is that we are spending more time constructing a site or reconstructing an idea of what a site can be 
so that the architectural expression in some ways can be so light and delicate as to be barely there. Uh, for Brooklyn Botanic Garden Visitor Center, there was a moment over this 400 uh, linear foot stretch that its urbanity and presence of architecture at the edge of the city is quite ex explicit. But by the time it makes it into the garden from certain angles, you can barely see it as anything other than a crack in the topography uh, as sort of an inhabitant rather than an explicit structure. Design has to be broader than just creating a kind of a, a symbol or a setting. There's a, a performative quality to it too. So how we store water, how we catch water, um, were paramount to the design, which they would not have been um, uh, 10 years ago. And I think uh, now the, the, the escalation of the crises we're all facing, even in the context of an isolated, uh, of an embassy, uh, are really forcing us to rethink how we uh, approach it. Yeah, I would also, um, particularly in the context of this discussion, uh, with students of architecture. I, I think there are many architects who are um, extremely proficient, extremely talented at creating a series of sculptural objects. And they have developed a very sophisticated language by which the, um, the form could be developed as, a, as an object. And I think the idea of delaying architecture also has to do less with a an a priori form that could be literally positioned anywhere, and more with the sense that architecture matters, but it has to come from that which often is unseen. And um, so to that extent, um, the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, for example, derived from a series of paths and a series of um, landforms that were pre-existing so that by amplifying the kind of role of the path uh, through the use of architecture, we in effect delayed um, the development of the form until we understood the larger context of the site as infrastructural capacities, a series of routes, series of flows, so that the building in a way um, becomes a servant to its larger context and its larger performative agendas. Mm. Mm. Uh, by the way, you could say the square footage is finite, the stretch yeah. and engagement pathways of which right. Olmsted is the heart of actually the generation of all those paths mm -hmm. in that garden. In many ways, its affiliation with that idea of giving shape to a journey gave it a stretch and amplitude that it might not have had had he simply respected the square foot requirements that were given to us for visitor center. Right. Well, journey is another topic that we have to discuss. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think uh, also uh, with this whole notion of delaying architecture, uh, when you're talking to uh, students or young architects, they're so impatient to get there. So uh, we have to really understand what's going on here. Uh, it could mean a number of things uh, with the work of other contemporary architects whom we follow or look at closely. I'm thinking of Kengo Kuma, for example, uh, mm -hmm. where uh, he talks about weak form uh, based on this idea of weak ontology uh, or the dissolution of forms. Well, forms have not dissolved, but I think there's a sort of interesting fragility mm -hmm. or implied, fra implied, implied fragility to the form. So, right, it's this sort of uh, intertwining is the term if one can bring from phenomenology. Um, uh, so weak form, but also in your work, uh, there is a kind of still a, a robustness to the uh, what is sort of the precise architectural form, and beyond that, there is also the geological form. There is a preciseness, or there is even a sharpness, um, and I wonder if that uh, caters to what uh, Fr Professor Frampton describes as tectonic firmness. I think there is something that you mentioned that architecture still has an import, otherwise we can't even begin. So, uh, yeah, so I, I think uh, uh, there is then, at the end of the day, if I, if I may say so, there is in your work, uh, I, we, we see, I see a tectonic firmness, a robustness, uh, 
a, uh, both in a sort of the, the architectural figures and also the geological figures, if that's mm -hmm. the correct evaluate, the correct understanding. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I actually, uh, good point because I, I think we do create forms, uh, whether those forms are uh, mineral um, and uh, made of stone or steel or vegetal. Um, the forms uh, do have um, an impact, um, and that impact is something we're particularly interested in, and we are also, I suppose, interested in um, not absolving the responsibility of form, but imbuing it with uh, a very specific agenda, and that agenda might be uh, urban, it might be infrastructural, ecological, uh, or all of the above. So, to get back to maybe an example like the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, um, once we felt that we understood the kind of pressures uh, of the site, and I love the idea of weak form. So in a way that building um, like bamboo bent with the sort of winds, um, it wasn't necessarily weak, but it acknowledged a set of di different conditions. And, um, that form is very specific. There's a very specific S shape that takes the kind of existing pathways and gives it measure and, but it also then takes a very specific section, it embeds itself in the earth so you can approach the building from a higher elevation and move down through it or from a lower elevation and move up into it. So there's a very specific section and in that sense, uh, the form is very overt. Um, it's apologetic. And um, to an extent, uh, we would emphasize that we as designers do have to, have to take on the responsibility of creating form and making it both beautiful, um, making it haptic, uh, making it performative, uh, uh, in a way, um, giving it a kind of multi-dimensional characteristic that uh, is, I think, at the essence of great architecture, great landscape. And just to expand on your question, uh, Kazi, about the kind of geologic, I think that gets at what Michael was describing with the Brooklyn Botanic Garden Project, is the idea of topography is both accepted and invented um, in our own. And to some extent, that manipulation of these uh, accepted and invented topographies accommodate ecological flows, but also social right. flows. So at the Hunters Point South Waterfront Park, that was a case left over water's edge. It had been, in fact, contaminated through industrial use. It had been a wetlands that had been overthrown, in a sense, by that industrial use. And so in its abandoned state, uh, in thinking about it as a new park that was going to situate the development of a new urban, affordable housing precinct, mm. what we discovered was that there was a topography that was 30-foot grade change. And that allowed us then to do a few things, which is at the upper edge, create routes that could actually take advantage of that aerial condition with the great views that were panoramic of the city. But at the water's edge, actually cut down and create a fortification that could actually slalom against the water, allow you wetlands on one side, the river on the other, so that you truly feel like you're walking on water. And that invented topography that protected the wetlands was also one that created an invitation to lose yourself from the structure of the city and find yourself at that kind of wandering ecology of that water's edge that is at once both invention and a reinvention of that which had been lost you know, over 300 years, 400 years ago. So the, the question of the geologic in some ways inspires a way of thinking and operating that is about a stratification of levels that can do many different things. And when you bring the notion of journey or topography into that, what we do know is on a very simple term, to get from here to here in a gentle way requires a distance of this. And that distance is what really um, amplifies the experience of a site. Great. No, I think uh, then we can talk about journey now. Uh, because with the yes. geology, you have this, you have that also and then you weave uh, this journey, if you like, uh, movement, architectural promenade, uh, and which is so beautifully set up in Seattle. 
um, which is also related to what Michael said earlier uh, about flows also, the flow of people and the flow of people in conjunction with ecological flows also. But I, know I, I do want perhaps talk a little bit about how a movement system is also part of the experience of the landscape. You know, uh, when as humans we, uh, or as, or as uh, designers, we talk about landscape, it's really about people and movement in the landscape. And therefore uh, engaging what you have uh, articulated through paths, walls, land shapes, you know, those are the sort of the cues of engaging people in this movement system. Um, and then therefore also connecting sort of very discrete and non-discrete spaces along the route of movement, which is very, 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 I, mean, I think it's a very important sort of, you know, aspect of your work, which I think students and young architects should understand. It's not about, as we talked about a little earlier, about robust form, whether architectural or geological. So I think the movement system uh, and the movement system ultimately also brings up well, the human body. The, the presence of the body, which if I may uh, point out, I don't know how you feel about it, which, which is not quite discussed in the remarkable round table that you engaged in your book. Uh, I don't think the body as such, was, it was sort of present, you know, in a kind of unstated way. But I think the whole question of the presence of the body in, its, uh, in the sense of traversal, in the sense of measure of the side through the body, I think it, it since to me it's already there uh, also so that's one aspect if you want to respond to that the other aspect is you know i think barry bergdahl men mentions uh, a kind of uh, reconstitution of the english landscape architecture tradition in a very remarkably innovative way in many of your projects especially seattle and if i may point out if seattle is in a condensed form in the Singh center at penn or even the Bard uh, Center, because it's about, I mean, I went to the Bard Center, I was going up and down and sort of, you know, it's about like uh, intimate, intimacy and vistas simultaneously, which is, you know, is a purely landscape design, uh, you know, practice. Anyway, so that's what I think. On the one hand, the presence of the human body in its sort of, in, in its engagement with the landscape. Yes. Um. You know, Kazi, both Michael and I have uh, been reflecting on what you've been saying in a, a lot of recent discussions because it, in some ways what we're interested in is this idea of peripheral vision. And uh, with architecture, often we want to be at the heart of things, but sometimes we want to be at the edge of things, but have an ability to scan detours uh, where the kind of, in a sense, the renegade can go as, as opposed to the directed uh, individual. and what begins to work in our favor with sections is to be able to have places where you have opportunities for and a sense of being part of something larger, but not necessarily having to be part or center of it. And arguably that's what makes a city so extraordinary. Um, you can be in the heart of the action without being at the center of it, but feel energized by that very consensus of a community brought together. And so this idea of both movement and peripheral vision starts to figure in the frameworks that we like to give our architecture, which is arguably the both and, which is that there is the place of kind of public dimension, but there is also a place of overlook and retreat. Yeah, I think, um, Kazi, this idea of the body um, is something we've actually been reflecting on with a greater frequency. And part of it is, I think, as our world is extraordinarily uh, virtual, uh, in many ways, the importance of the body, the importance of how we feel, how we see space, how we hear sounds, for us, it, I think, is becoming more and more important um, because we're losing, I think, mm -hmm. that touch. And I think architecture's great gift is to remind us of where we are in a particular place and time. And um, you mentioned the Bernard Project. There, the circulation, the promenade, which is a word that I think is very important, to us is designed um, so that you're always moving both in the building and aware of its internal configuration, but then the stairs slide outside of the surface of the building and you're reminded of your place in the city. And it's our hope that um, as you move through that particular building, 
you're always reminded of your role as both an individual but as part of a collective. And the sense of being in the world, again, is uh, architecture's great gift. And to that extent, I think we also owe a debt to um, the discipline of choreography, which we, I think, um, haven't talked about much, um, but it goes back to your point about promenade, about flow, about the sections. How do you choreograph those so they're not accidental, they're very intentional? Again, I think architecture is a great gift. Mm -hmm. But That's right. But uh, will you agree that uh, both at the Singh Center at Penn and the Diana Center at Bard College is a compression? As a sort of compressed sort of sensibility of the Seattle project, you know. Uh, Correct. Correct. Uh, you know, it's very interesting when you mention, in particular, the Singh Center Nanotechnology. What we were very invested in in the, in the creation of that building was not simply accommodating these very, very uh, clear, hard-working laboratories, but actually bringing to the surface those very you know, focus researchers to the public realm. And in so doing, that public realm unfolds around a courtyard that is part of the campus. It's the public, too. And it's the public. It's the public. And then as we look at that ascension up to the uppermost level, the very highest level is not the place of retreat and research, but it's the place of presentation and forum. And so the Glant Forum at the very top, uh, named in honor of it, Eduardo Glant, the visionary uh, dean of engineering who was responsible for making this building happen. It was really about saying, this is where the community comes together for all kinds of conversations and presentations. And it's where the public realm actually has its great statement. So that, that huge, you know, 60 foot cantilever that reaches out over the green is really a declaration of saying that the conversation and convening is really the apotheosis of that idea as it ascends to join its urban stature. So it's Seattle, as you noted, right. turned vertically, but, but that right. sectional promenade is uh, uh, common to both projects or common to many projects that we're interested in. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, but that uh, perhaps uh, we can return to uh, the other, the, the important aspect uh, we already mentioned, the ecological aspect in many of your projects, especially Hunter's Point and the uh, the. Toronto project, which still remains uh, in process, I believe. Uh, in construction. Point. Yeah. And in construction, great, right. Um, which, uh, which brings, uh, you know, what your work is, you know, the intersection of the public and the natural and the urban, mm -hmm. so they're like sort of three uh, streams, if you like. Now, so the, my thought is, you know, not quite uh, directed to the projects itself, but perhaps they are. Uh, but it's for my own understanding, like these three streams, if you like. Um, and uh, we all agree that they are constantly being eroded, right? Uh, whether by the whole sort of the parceling of the city and the parceling of how we, uh, how we acquire or invest and organize spaces in the city. And so that's one. Uh, or the sort of the what we discussed earlier, the fallouts of technological sort of you know uh, uh, investments. Uh, but at the end of the day, they are even if they're eroded, the three the streams are intertwined, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems to me your project is right at the intersection of these intertwining. So they kind of bring up this sort of you know three streams right in your face, if you like. Uh, the urban and the natural, if we, can, if we can just boil this to the urban and the natural, you know, within the urban, the public is also part of the urban. Um, is this a continuum? Is this, are there like two parallel streams? Are they are intersectional? Or is there an, another option that's, uh, that's brought up in your projects? Or you want to see this sort of unresolved at this moment, you know, how the, how the intersection is happening. Um, uh, well, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's one, that's, I think that's one thought, but uh, perhaps another thing at this point, we can also mention, and we discussed this last Tuesday, uh, the, the impact of say natural phenomenon like Katrina or Sandy, which then heightens what we are discussing right now gets heightened by such natural phenomenon which also heightens our sense of fragility uh, with our constructed worlds. 
and if I may describe it this way, which makes our robust swagger uh, limpid, you know, the robust swagger of architecture is made limpid, you know. So uh, I don't know if I'm saying quite a few things, but I think your work is at the intersection of all these uh, thoughts that I'm, I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. well, I like your, uh, your term or, or this term, uh, weak form, because it does acknowledge the um, importance of form, but also recognizes sometimes in weakness there's great strength. Um, I think as a companion thought to that, we, we need to abandon, uh, I think, the distinctions between the natural world and the artificial world, uh, what's constructed and what's natural. I think at this point, every meter of this earth has been touched. Um, it's no longer pristine and I think the climate changes that are uh, occurring so quickly and certainly in your country too, um, I think point to the fact that imagining a pristine world um, that is untouched is uh, no longer a valid um, uh, approach to solving uh, formal problems as well as environmental problems. So I think we, we like this sort of intersection and perhaps it does not need a kind of complete conclusion, as you say, that maybe a certain level of indeterminacy to mm. how you privileged the natural, is it part artificial or is it primarily artificial and some natural. So I think in projects that are overtly architectural, um, we want to recognize that, also recognize their uh, capacity to shift um, natural systems. And um, even in small projects, there is a, a kind of a, a rearrangement. And as David Leatherborough, I think, has so beautifully put, um, sites are not neutral. Sites are made. And no matter how precise and how uh, specific an intervention is, it completely reorders that site. And that site then has a larger climactic, geologic, uh, territorial, shift that uh, becomes extremely interesting. Mm. Okay. Um, well, I think that's also uh, the point about keeping it, well, unresolved, if you like, or mm -hmm. open-ended. I, I think that the notion of open-endedness came up quite a bit in the last discussion, which is also in some sense about flow on the one hand, also porosity, if you like. Uh, and I think to make it more uh, concrete uh, in an urban sense, you know, uh, dealing with property lines and overflowing property lines, which we see in your project uh, over and over again. And I think Michael said it beautifully, flows are agnostic to property lines. Uh, and which, uh, and Marion, uh, I think in that context mentioned, and I'm recalling that uh, this, this uh, asks for new agency for designers, uh, recast, design obligations and I, I wonder if you want to talk about that a little bit you know, mm -hmm. you know but, I, but I, I was also thinking maybe uh, uh, this idea of property line and this is something that I have interrogated especially in the context of Dhaka in Bangladesh where uh, and it's not just an architectural project property line it's a, it's first of all a capitalist project right ownership yeah. ownership like you know uh, dividing that's how planning happens in Dhaka, and which i have consistently written about and rejected you know uh, the idea of planning means going out there filling up a flat plane uh, and uh, you know and then dividing into plots and then it, invite the architects to make all these wonderful buildings. So what? You have already made the, you know, the incredible damage that you can do. So, uh, but then we are uh, beholden to properties and property line, you know, um, forget Dhaka, anywhere, Philadelphia, anywhere. New York. Mm -hmm. But what you just said made me think that uh, as in the project, uh, the nanotechnology project you, you were mentioning, how do you uh, bring the wider world into, the, into that property, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. that's number one. Or conversely, how do you take the constricted property and push it to the wider world, which is what yeah. happened in Seattle, yeah. if I may say yeah. so. Man, that's yeah. incredible. Yeah. 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 Right. I yeah. mean, that thank was you. thank you. I mean, that that's yeah. the interesting 
question. I mean, our, our fairly recent book, Public Natures, is really trying to look at this question of how even the most privatized projects can have a That's right. dimension. That's right. That issue of both inclusion and transparency, literally and figuratively, in the expression. You know, mm -hmm. it's ultimately that these kind of uh, territorial ideas translate into material expression. And I think that's where it is architecture, not planning. Um, yeah. And they're very, very, yeah. that, that link to right. material and physical expression is that's right. that's an right. interesting question. And oh, uh, thing uh, to uh, uh, just to add to that thought, Kazi, is that um, uh, flows, whether they're flows of people, flows of water, uh, flows of that's air, right. wind, um, are agnostic to property lines. They don't care mm. about lines. Right. And, uh, that's that's, that's the, right. the the capitalist challenge. That's right. Is yeah. once you define a property line, you've uh, ignored the fact that the natural world is uh, absolutely much larger. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. the question of what our obligations are as designers, I think, is uh, probably getting larger and larger because so much is at stake. Um, certainly, mm -hmm. environmental challenges that uh, we're all addressing. It's impossible to simply respond to the question of typical briefs, which is to build something that is of a certain scale and a certain budget. And our obligations as designers, I think, is to actually stand back and delay not only the response to that, but to delay the assumption that that is indeed the right question and in the right place. And sometimes that should pull further and further back to say, what is really at stake here? What's, the, what's essential? Um, and versus what is maybe uh, less essential. So I, I, I say this in terms of what, do we, what are our obligations as architects. I think we need to be at the table sooner. We need to be in the conversation sooner so that at least within what I would describe as the agency of thinking and as describing what's at stake. Urban design used to have a very, very large voice in the 60s and 70s that mm. became quieter if you will, long enough to allow everybody to have big, big projects and once exactly what they were asked to do in a very large way. Um, through, but there was, in a sense, a suppression of thinking systemically about what larger considerations uh, were on the table that we could and should be addressing. Landscape architecture has since, I think, been able to put into focus many of the ecological and environmental questions, and yet there is still an urban question at stake that is not being addressed as robustly as it might be. So you could argue that some of our job as architects is particularly in the, in the place of cities, is to think about those larger terms and conditions and think about, in a sense, what's, what's at stake in engaging in those systems or maybe redirecting a few of them with something uh, when something larger can be achieved and accomplished. Yeah, yeah. what I love about um, how the Bengal Institute describes itself, and I think this is very germane, it's architectural landscape settlements. And for us, the idea of settlements is not just buildings within property lines, but it's larger networks. And whether those settlements are a series of paths, whether they're a series of buildings, or a series of um, uh, agricultural encampments, uh, I think that way of thinking about design um, is absolutely attuned to the pressures that we as a global society are facing. So the privileging of, even through the simple act of creating a home, recognizes or privileges the larger idea of settlement. The larger idea of settlement is both architectural and uh, about the landscape. So I think in that sense, um, what, what the Institute is doing is very much, I think, um, um, aligned with our own um, thinking and that, that sense of a larger responsibility is at the heart of what we hope to achieve in our work, however small that might be. And I, and I think that that gets right back to the question of it truly is demanding infrastructural thinking and that in many cases you could say that the real revolutionary yeah, work yeah. done has to be infrastructure in its intent and thinking, even if the uh, expression of form is strategic and mm -hmm. arguably it can be even more strategic and use less embodied energy if indeed we think of the kind of infrastructure that's at stake. So it's, it's, it's a reciprocity between both and sometimes it allows you to build less 
do less because we're encouraging far more that's around. Um, in, a, in East Africa, that remains in its confidential status, uh, we were working on a very topographically uh, robust site and discovered that rather than building in the valley or at the top of a hill, we could, in a sense, build between and create a series of precincts that were made stronger by their ability to inhabit that topography and leverage privilege of being above to everyone and being below to the landscape and the garden. And so in a sense, figuring out where to operate is sometimes about asking that question one more time when one is given a brief about where a site can and should be. Right, I think this could be a right moment, uh, a reminder to younger architects and younger friends who may be listening to this afterwards that it's not after all about big projects, but about larger obligations, uh, which may not be written up in the brief or the program, but, uh, but and that, that accepting or even un first of all, understanding the larger obligations and you can understand the larger obligation, but you can override or ignore them, but then you need to engage with the larger obligations. I think what your projects uh, set up, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, things also have to be built as, a, as, a, as a, an example, right? And your projects are built and they remind us not only as say, lar big projects, but also uh, engagement with larger obligations in the most sort of compelling way. Um, and uh, thank you, Michael, for uh, noting uh, how we named our organization, Architecture, mm -hmm. Landscapes and Settlements. And it was no particular order. Uh, but again, uh, architect, you know, uh, at what Frampton says, at the end of the day, uh, you know, what what do we have if not architecture? And I, I quite follow that. It may not be quite tectonic all the way, and there I differ a little bit. Um, but you know, landscape, agriculture, they're all sort of part of the archi architectural operations, and therefore, I, what I mentioned our earlier, architecture is bigger than architecture, and I say that in a, in a kind of uh, motivational way and mm -hmm. settlements yes we struggled a little bit whether we should call it architecture landscapes landscapes and urbanism which is kind of obvious and we didn't want to do that you know because you're quite right you know there's the homestead in that little setting uh, in our bengali landscapes well that's a settlement whole cluster of houses that's a settlement a village in the landscape working with the floods and waters and paddy fields, that's a settlement. And then yeah. the big metropolis with all its sort of craziness, that's a settlement. And I think we have challenges in all these aspects. So there is no way of privileging one and the other. The moment you say urbanism, it's already privileged. And the moment you say rural, that's another kind of privileging. So we wanted to stay with, for mm -hmm. now, a provisional term, settlement, but frankly, we are still working for a, uh, um, I don't know, another term. Uh, yeah, yeah architecture is bigger than architecture. Uh, that's a great line. Um, maybe we can pursue that in right. That's right. conversation yeah. because uh, I think as the professions have become more professional, as, as again, you've said, um, the limitations have become greater too. And that, I think, precludes... Um, a broader way of thinking about our environment. Um, architecture right, protects architects, landscape That's right. architecture profession, the civil engineering discipline is only carried, you know, That's right. and uh, there's very little uh, conversation, which is a great tragedy. Yeah, well, it's transcalar, which is again, what right. is part of your agenda and certainly an agenda in our own work. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Can we uh, can we talk about you know that uh, that uh, beautiful project that's ongoing right now uh, in Delhi, the U.S. Embassy, uh, the the addition, if you like, or the expansion? Um, it's under construction right now, right? Is it under it's construction? Just, just beginning. It's just, just beginning. beginning. Okay. Okay. And uh, uh, later, will we be able to see some images from you while we talk? Can we show some drawings? Some yes. Ongoing, yes. you know, for drawings. Okay. Because with embassies, you never know. There are restrictions. Yes, there, there are selected images that we can show. That's right. So, which is what I want to talk about restrictions. Uh, U.S. Embassy in Delhi, Edward Dural Stone on the one hand, and then you have the whole sort of, you know, the historical uh, sort of setup of uh, Edwin, Edwin Lachians in Delhi. Uh, both operating at a representational realm. 
no matter what, you know, uh, the embassy, embassy building and of, and of course, uh, Eurostone's building and Lachian's dominant aspect, uh, you know, the representational sort of realm, you know, uh, you, and, and you mentioned earlier, maybe you want to discuss this now, overcoming that, but you, you know, that's that, that's there. But what I want to point out uh, is that with Lachians, there's the whole sort of colonial English presence in South Asia, especially India. And with Edward Durrell Stone, there is, there is the American political might in the 1950s. And the building kind of plays a sort of a double game, uh, not quite exposing the might, but also being porous in some sense, the screens and what have you, whether it comes out of environment, environmental reasons and all that, but there is that uh, aspect. So I, I thought that both Lachians and Edward Durrell Stone were trying to be, what is the word? ameliorative via architecture, you know, modulating if you like. But you, you mentioned you wanted to go beyond the representational conundrum of an embassy. Right? Um, and, uh, and, and in all, in, in all your projects, uh, we already talked about flows and overflowing, uh, exceeding the site, uh, porosity, but in the embassy, uh, it seems to me this kind of loops into itself, if you like. Am, am I right in saying that? But of mm -hmm. course, you know, you will talk about the performative aspect, but I think I want to talk about first, you know, the looping of the, the, the sort of the porosity of other projects within the site itself. Uh, yeah, Tazi, was, you're touching on many, many things that are at stake in the in our project for the U.S. Embassy in New Delhi, India, and uh, a few things about embassies is that they are, by their very nature, bounded compounds because there's much at stake uh, that happens inside that is sometimes, uh, in a sense, somewhat independent of the sites that they're on. Uh, interesting point of entry for us, though, uh, gets at that question of representation. Uh, in fact, when the U.S. Embassy is doing spaces, they literally identify a programmatic line which is called representational space. Mm -hmm. It is saying, how do we as a country choose to represent our valuing of the country we are in to create places of engagement where our collective and shared values have a place to be and be given a kind of symbolic significance. So. For us, that, that's a point of entry, which is very interesting. It needs to be protected, and hence the idea of walls are not just about um, security, but they are about protecting a conversation and a dialogue, just as a garden is a garden, not a landscape, on the basis of those walls. And that's what gives protection and identity. So for us, the entry into the project, in many ways, was not just through the inspiration of Edward Durrell Stone's beautiful translation of almost a kind of tropical modernism with the jolly mm. screen, billion mm. merge. Uh, but it was the idea that landscape has been very much at the center of that which has been given uh, value. Stone was inspired by um, the Taj Mahal and its relationship to building and landscape. But the Lodi Gardens, which actually preceded uh, our sort of visit to the uh, embassy site itself, was so inspiring to see that relationship in topography, path, landscape, and architecture, that those were also points of recasting those 27 acres and new buildings uh, that we're uh, introducing, if you will, to refresh the, um, uh, the, the identity of the uh, embassy. Yeah, it's interesting. Lutchens is a very complex character, and I think uh, this would be part of a discussion that, um, as we've talked to some of our Indian colleagues, um, it's, um, it's quite complex on one hand, I think at this point, that complex is deeply embedded um, in the history of um, Delhi. Um, the, um, the, the U.S. Embassy by Edward Durrell Stone, I think it, maybe because of its size, has a, a different agenda, which was to introduce modernism and to give modernism in a way um, um, an ecological um, presence or an ecological, give, give it a, a stronger ecological agenda. And um, what we found is that forgetting the form, which is overtly modernist, 
in the development of that project, there were a number of ecological measures, uh, the passage of air over water, that we found actually very inspirational, more than the form itself. Um, our project and the um, Edward Drell Stone project both share a very deep roof that now more than ever provides uh, the absolutely necessary uh, life-affirming uh, shade uh, because as India has gotten much hotter, shade is no longer a luxury, it's a requirement, it's a necessity. But it also, the roof captures water and the capturing water, which increasingly, again, is, is precious, there's often too much or too little, never in balance. We capture water, detain it, and then use it slowly and thoughtfully over the course of the year. So in that sense, um, we acknowledge Edward Durrell Stone's very early ecological agendas. Um, again, attempt to sort of humanize modernism and to um, acknowledge the very, very particular climate of India. But as Marion mentioned, uh, Lodi Gardens were also an inspiration, Fatipur Sikwi, with this beautiful modulation of the ground plane. And it's very, very sort of uh, precious development of water was something that was extremely important. So there are a number of um, examples that preceded uh, Edward Durrell Stone, preceded Lutyens, and went back to, you know, 14th century Mughal garden design mm. that for us is not only symbolically very important, but ecologically extremely relevant. Oh, I, I, I really uh, uh, agree with that uh, observation about Edward Durrell Stone's uh, project. Uh, first of all, uh, making modernism what could be now then seen as contemporary tropical modernism and expanding the modernist agenda towards what you might now call ecological. But they were not quite saying that that way at the time. And I think at the time, the conversation was more around environment and climate, you know, it's more, more pragmatic. But I think uh, now we can see them as precursors to an ecological agenda. I quite agree with that. And I think at that time in the 1950s, uh, a group of other architects, I mean, of course, you know, Le Corbusier in, uh, in Chandigarh, and in Ahmedabad, it's already kind of setting up that theme uh, in all kinds of ways. And then the Indian architects, Achyut Khan Binde, uh, Charles Correa a little later, uh, Krishna Doshi a little later, but also Mazharul Islam in Bangladesh. They were all at the forefront of this, right? You know, uh, the ecological agenda of modern architecture. And I think that's, um, so it's not quite, uh, it's not quite, how should I say this, as gardens, right? You know, gardens, it's still like an aesthetical sort of, em, you know, sort of emblem, right? So, yes, on the one hand, it's about tropical modernism, and, and as you mentioned, on the other hand, Mughal gardens. But the two, they, they're still two. They're still in that sort of uh, sense of house and garden, like they're two things, you know, there's a, not duality, they're like two-ness. But in your work, there is an intertwining, you know, so I think, uh, because of the work that you've already done before, but now in, uh, not contrast, but in comparison to Edward Dural Stone, what uh, is Tunis, in your case, they are intertwined. I wonder if you can get to that. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good probe. Tazi, it's a, it's a great question, and there's, um, in many ways, you could say a beautiful parallel in the two buildings, the building that Edward Dural Stone did and the new building that we're doing, and they're side by side. Uh, in the Edward Durrell Stone building, there is the pavilion on the plinth, and then there's that beautiful circle of water, which is completely representational with the components. And then our new building, which is, you know, as big or bigger than the other one, we're actually doing everything to push some things down so that it can remain sort of a companion in scale. There's a couple of transformations happening that are intertwining both the buildings' identities with each other and also intertwining this consideration of, of ecology and environment and architecture. In the Edward Rail Stone Building with the pavilion and the circle of water, we're taking that circle of water from its simply representational status and using it mm. actually through that incredible work of water collection. So that as Michael mentioned, all that deluge that can happen um, in the seasons when rain is plentiful is gathering water for those moments where rain is not plentiful. 
in the new building, what we are doing is we are creating, as Michael described, the canopy, which also protects from the sun. But a skim of water is in the forecourt. So rather than separate from the building, that uh, evaporative cooling that could come as you actually cross what seemingly feels like a moat is simply happening with a thin skim of water that is creating a cooling environment before you enter the building. And so we're merging, rather than separating those two elements, we're bringing them together so that it has the representational and environmental uh, identity at the same time. And those are cast into a journey that allows them to come in and actually stretch over the two campus uh, precincts because they cover two city blocks. Yeah, I, I think they're also, uh, I'm really happy you, you're, you're probing uh, a bit. Um, the Edward Durrell Stone is still fundamentally a modernist building on a neutral ground plane. Beautiful temple. Right. Um, you can't touch it, you can't you know, add to it. It's uh, an extraordinary sculptural uh, object. I think what we were trying to do is acknowledge the objectness of it, but in the case of our building, there is a whole uh, lower level of sunken gardens and courtyards that transform the ground plane between the two buildings, also allow us to connect to the Edward Durrell Stone building. So um, probably a um, uh, significant portion of our building is uh, less of an object, but more a series of courtyards embedded into, uh, into the Norman uh, public ground plane. Are there also excavations, like uh, right. dipping Excavated. into the ground? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which then could be seen as antithetical to the sort of the, the you know, the, the more point. conventional modernist sort of lifting up, right. you know, or, yeah. right. right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, um, would love to see how it develops. And uh, at least for now, I would love to see some images, you know, uh, whenever it's yeah. uh, you yeah. know, ready to, ready to be shared. Okay, uh, I think we're uh, we are sort of at the end of our conversation. Uh, and as a last topic, yeah, the city of Philadelphia, uh, yes. where I am, uh, it's uh, well, I have two homes, Kaka and Philadelphia. That has happened, uh, and uh, and I, what can I say? I love Philadelphia. I love Philadelphia, you know, and the public realm of Philadelphia, which goes back to well, I, I'll be saying a few things here. And then I want to <laughs> pose a possibility to you with that image. Uh, also, your relationship to Philadelphia, because you know you live in New York, but you're so much invested in Philadelphia with your continuous teaching at Penn, where we that, that's where we met, and I, I have lived in Philadelphia and live in Taka back and forth. Um, I love Philadelphia uh, because, uh, you know, what we have discussed a little bit, you know, discussed before about flow, being in the flow of the city, the continuous sort of the surface of the city. And I find uh, Philadelphia is a good example of being both compartmental and continuum. Even buildings are boxes, but I think there's a continuum. Know, it's, you know, so it's not like formally a continuum, but so I love that. Like even Penn campus uh, in relationship to the city, and I compare other campuses uh, where I belong uh, in Cambridge, Boston, uh, th those campuses, and I, I think the relationship to the city as compared to Penn and the city is, you know, much more sort of, you know, the, the whole notion of flow and porosity is much more beautiful to experience. Um, but I, I bring up this image to you uh, as a kind of, I don't know, I'm tempted to ask you, well, here you are, uh, uh, evolutionary infrastructures or uh, a potential mega form to happen, which hasn't happened, which, you know, do you have some quick thoughts here where you have the railroad dividing the city from the riverbank right and then on the other side there's the highway and as you know around the rail station new buildings are popping up as new buildings will pop up on property lines as towers but then there's the horizontal sort of uh, the continuum continuing and uh, of course you know these are sort of new uh, attempts of going into the river you know and creating public rail uh, but there you are the railroad uh, the new walkway 
the fringe of nature, if you like, the trees just about to kind of pop up from under the walkway. I wonder, you know, if you have some like immediate thoughts that, you know, about this. You know, I think, uh, Kathy, one of the great things about living in New York and teaching, teaching at Penn is the train ride uh, is right. always to you the status of the city and the landscape in motion. And, and seen in motion, we also see it when it's submerged with water or when there's all kinds of things that make it break down because those flows are impacted by so many Yet what is so beautiful is that relationship in particular the rail lines and the water from the journey of, of being, uh, say, in the train. Uh, it also asks this question <coughs> now of the aerial opportunity to span from the city over the train tracks and in a sense be part of that uh, aqueous uh, and in motion landscape. So the real question then is, this is something always in flux. We certainly noticed that the infrastructure in Philadelphia so bad that often sea waters make the right in the middle of the city and create the challenges of navigating the city proper. So that does raise the question that is in many ways not so much an architectural question, but a question of intent, which is perhaps with every very, very large structure that goes on up, could there be some implicit gifts that actually require us to actually invest some portion of that to the kind of public journey that's impacted by that? Uh, it's those kind of cumulative opportunities that get overlooked if they're bifurcated one at a time that need to be thought you will, as imminent domain of opportunities uh, that uh, for us are, are truly the most exciting questions to consider. And, you know, as we've talked about it, uh, they're neither architectural or engineering, uh, but there's something in between that is, you know, marvelously public right. uh, and organic at once. Yeah, but in, in another context, you said the potential promise. Do you <laughs> Do you see that in those two situations that I've just shown you? Yeah, yeah. I think in the photo that you sent, um, uh, one can, uh, I think, appreciate the potential, but also um, appreciate how much farther we need to go because uh, sometimes these attempts are so provisional, they're not systemic, they're just part of a kind of a, uh, a particular uh setting and moment and what is actually beautiful about philadelphia that i think you uh, i think brought up is that the plan of the city is fundamentally a network of open spaces and um settlements actually and i would use that mm -hmm. word mm -hmm. but what um what we love about philadelphia is that it has a sort of a beautiful plan that is replicable as you extend. And to that extent, I think what works so well about Penn is that it picks up that pattern of open spaces and buildings so that it is both part of the city locationally, but conceptually very much a mini city. And I think to the extent that your photo is evocative of the promise of those connections, um, it's quite beautiful and suggests an ambition that is not yet realized, but has potential. Okay. On that note, I think, uh, if, you know, if there's anything else you want to bring up, we can, but uh, I think we had some wonderful areas that we covered. Thank you so much, Marion, Michael. Yes. Thank you, Kathy. And, and thank you for kind of expanding this dialogue of what our and the terrains that it can engage. Great. So uh, we end here officially. Uh, the recording continues, but uh, you know we'll uh, work on editing this. And I think what Tawhid will do, send out a request to Lindsay for images that are appropriate. Um, and uh, obviously, if there are a few video images, that'd be great, you know, uh, or uh, we can do something. So over the next uh, one week or so, Tawhid will work directly with Lindsay, is that how it works? Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, we do have uh, a wealth of images. Uh, sure. I think, uh, speak to the projects that we talked about. So I think there's right. quite a bit of visual material. We do have some films 
that um, it might be um, that you all can take short. Right. That's right. You see fit in right. some ways. I think, Kazi, your your ability to um, frame this argument is something that we I think um, right. w would trust and have great confidence in. So you might see something that you think is very okay. important. Perhaps we don't want to be too prescriptive about the photos and images and uh, a film of uh, Seattle, a film Seattle, of Hunter's right. Point, and, and also uh, Sing Penn. Center. Penn. Sing Center, and right. I think. The so we have films of yeah for the oh, wonderful. So I think that'd be great if we if we get more than what we need, so we can make selections and choices. And what we will do at the beginning of the film is actually for one minute or so, just show Seattle in its fullness. So that will be introducing you without you know just Seattle and maybe some text. Fantastic. So I think if you have a film, that will be a way, way of like introducing. You. Wonderful. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Good. Great. Good. All right. What a Fantastic. great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. And hopefully, uh, well, we, we don't Thank know when. You. Thank you. Yeah. We'll, we'll see you in we'll we'll see you in Dhaka. <laughs> we we would love uh, that to would be love, there. Uh, we would yeah. love to That's do right. That. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, well, okay. maybe you're coming um, to Delhi anytime soon. Then it's just well. Uh, I think right. that's yeah. about, you know right now the uh, <laughs> big uh, question. Right? It's a big question of when to yeah. come. Right. The okay. construction uh, will be very slow over many years, so uh, we're hoping to uh, come to uh, Dhaka in the context of a visit to Delhi right. um, or Philadelphia. Sure, Philadelphia. But Dhaka especially, you know, uh, if I can mention this now, you know, I, I really want you to uh, come and take a look and understand. Uh, and as I said, it's not channelized. It overflows, shifts, you know, lands are created, eroded. And that's a new challenge. That's a different challenge, which architects yeah, and I can... Yeah, yeah. That's not one reason or a prime reason we set up the institute because you know architects as they're trained in Bangladesh or in the region, they're not trained in that manner. They're trained to work with a given site, a flat, given, stable site. Well, nothing is flat, nothing is given, nothing stays, you know. Uh, while people in a kind of uh, local wisdom, they had been working with that forever, you know. And, uh, and, you know they're, so this is something that perhaps it'd be interesting if you could come maybe Take yeah, a yeah. river, you know, river cruise, you know, go oh, down fantastic. the river. Not that big, crazy city. You'll find out Dhaka is crazier than any city. I've been to India, but uh, Dhaka is your ultimate challenge of, can you handle <laughs> the big city, <laughs> right? But, but we'll go beyond Dhaka and we'll take you to the Bengali landscape. And, uh, yeah. that, would be, that would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Or that. That'd be great. All right, All right. great. Good. Thank you. Bye Thank bye. you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. You know, Kazi, everything that you're bringing up is interesting because, you know, in addition to the studios and, and the work that we've done, that really, Michael's been teaching urban design at Harvard. And really, uh, you know, one of the things that um, has been very interesting is teasing out some of these contemporary challenges like pandemics and what mm -hmm. are we thinking and, and actually retroactive understanding of how these shocks to urban life have actually generated um, proposals that have improved and added. Yeah. And you're mentioning uh, Katrina, uh, I think was, uh, I, I remember Marion went down there. Um, we also, uh, I think, were deeply influenced by Katrina, but also um, Hurricane Sandy that came here, and, That's right. you know, designing waterfronts that have the ability to uh, absorb the shocks that will be facing our global uh, urban contexts with greater frequency. So that's also, I think, been an important shift. And mm -hmm. this, uh, this particular topic is something that would be obviously of great interest, not only to us, to you, but also I think, as you mentioned, it's, it's extremely relevant. That's right. um, the other thing that I think... Um, well, water you, as the excess of scarcity. Yeah, you know, you know the extremes, extremes. So too much water or as you can see... In, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, too much. Droughts or too little. Um, that's right. And um, 
Um, but you also mentioned this idea of, um, which I really like the idea of saying architecture is bigger than architecture. Um, that's a great line. Now move away from that, it's water. It's uh, mostly too much water in that area. Uh, less, less water, but it's too much water. And it's not static water, it's a very dynamic water system. How do you mm. work with that? Mm. And that really, it, it, you might be interested in this and we can talk about it. It really challenges uh, us architects into thinking about what we call site or location, which is never stable, right? And because, you know, we, you know, conventionally architects, especially back there, you know, you are given a plot of land. Right, and, and you know, that's a given thing. And then you go and you do your masterpiece there. But that fundamental thing is unstable. It may not be there or it, it's here one summer and next summer it's not there, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. But that's a very interesting challenge, which is, which is also led me to think about water in a, a very conceptual way, you know. Uh, for me, it involves uh, training architects with new, uh, terminologies, which are concepts actually, which is like, you know, ebb and tide, depth, plumbing, buoyancy, you know, all those terms that are about water, you know, how do you bring that into a design uh, conception mm -hmm. from the very beginning, rather than volume, cuts and incisions and so on and so forth, you know. That's interesting. You know, uh, our um, nanotechnology lab and uh, I like to think of it as an urban um, site, uh, as an urban construct. Uh, often laboratories are very anti-urban, they're very anti -urban. And there is a, an idea, I think, that may him come out in our conversation about um, architecture responding being so insular. Um, and that, that's something that's interesting too. It may not be quite related to water, but it's sort of right. no. idea of publicness, of publicness uh, right. breaking, yeah. breaking a definition of architecture as a purely a beautiful sculptural form, but having a larger uh, constituency. Right. No, but, but I think uh, water leads to a kind of new imagination. It doesn't have to be a water. It's a water yeah. imagination. And, and what... Uh, uh, Marian just said, you know, I, I really like that. And maybe we can discuss that delaying architecture as, as much as possible. Wow, it's wonderful. I want to think about that. Um, but I, but I, I was also thinking maybe uh, uh, this idea of property line. And this is something that I have interrogated, especially in the context of Dhaka in Bangladesh, where, uh, and it's not just an architectural project, property line. It's, a, it's first of all, a capitalist project, right? Ownership, mm -hmm. ownership, like, you know, uh, dividing. And that's how planning happens in Dhaka, and which I have consistently written about and rejected. You know, uh, the idea of planning means going out there, filling up a floodplain, uh, and, uh, you know, and then dividing into plots, and then invite the architects to make all these wonderful buildings. So what? You have already made the, you know, the incredible damage that you can do. So, uh, but then we are uh, beholden to properties and property line, you know, um, forget Dhaka, anywhere, Philadelphia, anywhere. New York. Mm -hmm. But what you just said made me think that uh, as in the project, uh, the nanotechnology project you, you were mentioning, how do you uh, bring the wider world into, the, into that problem, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. that's number one. Or conversely, how do you take the constricted property and push it to the wider world, which is what yeah. happened in Seattle, yeah. if I may say yeah. so. Man, that's yeah. incredible. Yeah. 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 Right. I mean, that thank was. You. Thank you. I mean, that that's yeah. the interesting question. I mean, our our fairly recent book, Public Natures, is really trying to look at this question of how even the most privatized projects can have a that's right. dimension. That's right. That issue of both inclusion and transparency, literally, intuitively, in the expression. You know, mm -hmm. it's ultimately that these kind of uh, territorial ideas translate to material expression. And I think that's where it is architecture, not planning. Um, yeah. And they're very, very, yeah. that, that linked right. material and physical expression is that's right. that's an right. interesting question. And oh, uh, and to uh, uh, just to add to that thought, Kazi, is that um, uh, flows, whether they're flows of people, flows of water, uh, flows of that's air, right. wind, um, are agnostic to property lines. They don't care mm. about property lines. 
Right. That's, and, uh, that's that's, that's the, right. the the capitalist challenge. That's right. Is once you define a property line, you've uh, ignored the fact that the natural world is uh, absolutely, much larger. absolutely. Yeah.